we're going to go through the rules we were doing and, uh, and look at various examples. So, um, let's see. We don't need this. space-time indices, alpha, beta, associated with the endpoints of the photon lines. So remember, photon line of moment, four momentum k, there are indices, alpha and beta, that are going to be matched up um, with the... Um, so 
each one of these vertices, there is, an, there is a, a factor gamma with a space-time index, and there are also um, space-time indices alpha, beta from the Feynman propagators. So they have to be uh, matched up properly and be summed over. We'll, we'll see how it, how it goes uh, in examples. Okay, three. Then we've got for each internal fermion line so here the line is of momentum P so there is a factor I S Feynman of P so it's the Feynman propagator, the fermion Feynman propagator, which we can write as I times 1 over P slash minus M plus I epsilon. Whereas I've explained that it's really shorthand for P slash plus M over P squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. Um, all right, so now we have rules for, i to get it all on one board, but it's not going to work. Um, all right. Okay, rules for external lines. For external lines, so you have an income, external lines means incoming and outgoing physical particles. Electrons, positrons, uh, and photons. Um, Alright, for external lines, we write the following factors. So let me write it like this, for an initial electron, there is a factor U P R for an in it for a final electron. Final electron. There's a factor U bar P R. For a um, initial positron, there's a factor V bar PR, and for a final positron, we have V PR. So for the electrons, the initial electron is a factor U, final electron factor U bar. U bar, then we have an initial and final. Sorry, I'm not writing, let me write it at least consistently here. Yeah, we're writing final, um, final E plus, final positron, factor V, E R. So initial positron, final positron, we have V bar and V P R. Okay, then if we have, um, so initial or final photon, there is a factor Epsilon K uh, alpha. So this is so epsilon K uh, alpha. This is a Lorentz four vector polarization four vector. 
for a photon with momentum k and polarization r, we've lowered the space-time index here because we've got indices raised on the gammas. So that's, that's what that is. All right, so initial and final photon is the fact that epsilon k are alpha. Okay. So then there is, and I, I want to get this all on one board. Um, in this rule number five, which is about the order of the factors, maybe. Um, These are four-dimensional column and row vectors are used in the U bars. So for each, for, so the order is as, follow, as follows. For each fermion line, for each fermion line. Um, how can I put it? Um, so reading from right to left. factors, in what order do you write them? So if you look at the, if you look at what you're writing down and you look at the order going from right to left, you should follow the same sequences along the direction of the arrows for each fermion line. Okay, so let's look now at, at, at some examples and then we'll see if there are any questions. So there are two other rules that are used when you have a loop. So we're, we're going to come back to those. Let's just look at the um, now, something I should mention, uh, that in the exam, by the way, in the exam, um, you will be given a copy of the list of Feynman rules. So basically this, um, so section 7.3, Point three of the book. Okay, there's also a list in the appendix, but I prefer the way they've written in here. In section 7.3, a couple of pages where they write down through this list of Feynman rules. You're going to be provided with a list with this list in the exam to refer to. Okay, so it's nice if you remember them, but the important thing is that you understand what you're doing and, and you can use them. Um, so, um, and when you go on to do, when you become high energy particle physicists working with different theories, and for instance, if you look in the book, you'll see in the appendix the list of Feynman rules for other theories. These are Feynman rules for quantum electrodynamics, the Feynman rules for electroweak theory, 
interaction of the Higgs boson with WZ bosons. Kind of, it's the kind of thing that you might not necessarily remember all, remember them all, but they're the rules that once they've been worked out, you look them up, you can use them. Anyway, let's look at some examples. So here's a first example. Let's say we're just looking at um, an electron. emitting a photon. So we have an electron is emitting a photon, which energetically can't happen by itself. Okay, remember in the S matrix element in front of the Feynman amplitude there's a, a delta function that conserves energy and momentum. This can't actually happen by itself, but it is the basic vertex out of which by making combinations of the basic vertex, you construct all the other processes. So, um, if you were just looking at this piece, and you were asked, well, what's the Feynman amplitude? So, as usual, we're going to, um, here I've written in the indices for um, polarization and spin. Um, we're going to follow the convention where PR is just replaced by P. KR is replaced by K, so the momentum index is understood that there is the spin or polarization index in there implicitly. It saves you writing a lot of indices. So, um, all right, so what's the Feynman amplitude here? So let's have a look at the Feynman amplitude. Now remember, the order of fermion factors. For each fermion line, we have to read from left to right and follow the same and follow the direction of the arrows. Okay, so we start, so you have to learn how to write, imagine you're Chinese and you're going to write from right to left for some reason. Historically, the convention is just developed like this, that you, you write from right to left. Maybe Feynman was left-handed, I don't know, maybe Murray can tell us. Anyway, so you start from the right and you follow the arrow. So what so going this direction the diagram. So what do we have? We have an initial electron of momentum P. So what do we do? We write down a factor UP. Okay, which is really UPR, but we leave off the spin index, UP. Then we keep following the arrow. What do we do? We hit a vertex. So when there's a vertex, what do we do? We write down a factor, i.e. gamma alpha. Remember, we're reading from right to left. So now we're at the vertex. Now we've got the final, we're following the fermion line, we've got a final electron of momentum P prime and a photon of momentum K prime. So for each of these, we have to write down an appropriate factor. So the, um, let's write in the photon part, um, epsilon k prime alpha. So I've left off the spin index, I've left off the polarization index, but the space-time index is important. It has to match up and sum with the space-time index that's on the gamma matrix. Alpha is going, remember, alpha is 0, 1, 2, 3. So, and it's being summed. Okay, repeated indices are summed over. Um, and then finally, there is, for the final electron, there is a factor U P prime. And, and that's it. That is the Feynman amplitude, which we derive by looking at the S matrix element for this process. You might remember we actually derived this. And, uh, and as I said, as I've said many times, the point is you could derive all these by working out S matrix elements. Um, but then it turns out that for all the different cases that, that you consider, that all of, the, all of the, in every case, the answer can be summarized by this set of rules, plus another two rules for, for loops. So, sorry? Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Someone is away. Thank you so much. Good. Yes, U bar. Final electron. Back to U bar. So, let's have a look at this. What do we do? Thank heaven because. Um, uh, pointed out to us. So here we have um, 
Here there is a uh, four-dimensional row vector. These are just numbers. Here I have a sum of four by four matrices. And here I have a, a four-dimensional row vector. So four by four matrix times the row vector gives me, sorry, times a column vector gives me a column vector. Then with the row vector, I get a number. The epsilons here, these are just numbers. So I could have put the order differently. I could have put the epsilon over here. It doesn't really matter. But it sort of looked neater to have them next to the gamma matrix because you're summing over the alpha index. OK, so, there, so this is a complex number. All right, this is a complex number. Now let's look at um, the analogous process, but for a positron. Let's look at a positron emitting a photon. So P, P prime. And of course, here, obviously, here we have P is, so P is equal to P prime plus K, K prime, K prime, K prime, because an overall uh, delta function. And so, of course, these, if you just look at the spatial components, Okay, here I've got these spatial uh, momenta P, P prime, K prime, P, so three momentum is conserved. So these P prime, P and K prime are not independent. All right, so now imagine we're looking at the analogous process for a positron. A positron emitting a photon. <clears throat> so now there is this funny convention that remember here in these diagrams, time is always going from left to right in the sense that on the left there is the initial state, on the right there is the final state. Okay? But for positrons, the lines, the arrows on the fermion lines go backwards. And you'll see why this, this, this is important. Because remember, if we want to write, so now we want to write down our Feynman amplitude. Remember, the reason, I, the reason I have to go backwards is because the way, for, for initial and final electrons, you have u and u bar. Whereas for initial and final positrons, you have v bar and v. They're flipped. So in order for, let me just show you, if we follow the Feynman rules and say, all right, now what's the ampli Feynman amplitude? Here is what it is. So how do you write that down? So you read from right to left, and you follow the direction of the arrows. So, um, I have a final positron of momentum p. So I write down a factor v, p, sorry, momentum p prime. So I write down for a final positron, we have a factor v. I then, I'm following the fermion line. Doesn't matter that it's going backwards. I'm following the direction of the arrows. I then hit the vertex. Um, sorry, I have a final, um, Final positron, momentum p, I write down the factor v. I also have a final photon of momentum k prime. So I write down the factor epsilon k prime with the space time index alpha. I then hit the vertex. So I write down the factor ie gamma alpha. I then continue following the, the fermion line. There is an initial positron. So I write down the factor v bar. Notice again the structure. I have a row vector times 4 by 4 matrices times a column vector, so I get a complex number. Okay. So you can see that because the, um, for, for positrons and electrons, this is the things of the U and the, the, the structure is flipped around in the sense that here is U and U bar, and here is V bar and V. So in order for this rule to be consistent, for the positron line, I have to follow the line backwards. So that is one way of thinking about why the arrows uh, go backwards uh, on, the, um, on the positron line. Okay, so that's the Feynman amplitude 
uh, for this process. All right, now let's look at a process that is actually uh, a physical process in the sense that it can occur uh, by itself. So let's look at Compton scattering, which I believe that, um, so we have an electron and a photon scattering off each other, so I believe we worked out the S matrix element as a whole, when I say we, I guess I mean you, worked out the S matrix element as a homework problem. It's the sort of thing that you have to do once in your life. You have to suffer pain and agony in order to grow and understand, but it's one of those things that once you've done it, you know that really, if you were a professional, you would say, well, if I want to know the S matrix element, I just write down the Feynman amplitude using the Feynman rules, which come from the S matrix elements. So um, let's look at um, so let's look at this process here. We have photon and momentum in K uh, scattering off, and so an initial electron and momentum P. Uh, final electron P prime, final photon K prime. The internal line here, remember the zero rule. The four momentum is conserved at each vertex. So there's an internal fermion line here with momentum Q equal to P plus K. Now, I've said it once, I've said it twice, I've said it lots of times, I'm going to say it one last time. Um, when you have these, if you have these momentum meeting at a vertex, so I have K, I have P, and I have Q that is equal to P plus K. The incoming particles are physical. We have a physical photon, so k squared is zero. We have a physical electron, so p squared is m squared. If you do the maths, play around a little bit, you can see that while q squared cannot equal m squared, it's impossible for q squared to equal m squared. Okay, because q is p plus k, in other words, p plus k squared cannot equal m squared. So what does this mean? These are physical particles coming in. This internal line, that's not a physical momentum. Okay, it's not a physical momentum. It's off, sometimes it's called a virtual momentum. Um, from our point of view of this course, it's just that this is, these diagrams are just a symbolic way of representing the results of a perturbation series, so we're not really going to worry about this. Some people will wave their hands at something, something about the uncertainty principle and say, that, well, during this process, it's what pe people will say, there's a hand-waving argument that says, look, these states are defined in the infinite past. So when you have an infinite time interval, you can define the energy and the momentum precisely. And similarly, these states defined in the infinite future. During the scattering over a finite time, you can't really define the energy exactly, so energy and momentum do not need to be exactly conserved. And so you can have virtual particles with these momenta that, 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 that look like this. This is just, this is some, you know, believe this if you like. It's a common argument. But um, from our point of view, um, this, is, this is just a symbolic representation of the perturbation series. So not to worry too much about this. Um, anyway, so we have our internal four momentum Q, which is not a physical four momentum. Q squared is not M squared. Now, what's the, um, what's the Feynman amplitude? Well, so here's the Feynman amplitude. So let me write it. Uh, down and we'll go through it. So one other thing 
I should mention is that it's highly likely that in the exam there will be a question about Feynman amplitudes and Feynman diagrams. The estimated probability for this is close to 1. That includes quantum effects. So, um, so there we go. So for this case, what do we do? Again, following the Feynman rules, we read from right to left. And we follow the arrow on the fermion line. We have an initial electron, initial photon. So we write down up and epsilon k beta. We then hit the vertex. We write down the factor i e gamma beta. We then here have an internal fermion line. Now remember the rule number three. Each internal fermion line of momentum p, you write the factor i s Feynman of p. Our internal fermion line has momentum p plus k. So we write the factor i s Feynman and with argument p plus k. We then keep following the arrow. We hit another vertex. So we have a factor i e gamma alpha. Then we have a final photon and final electron. So we have a factor of epsilon k prime alpha and the factor u bar p prime. Now notice, at each vertex here, you have, um, there's an index uh, beta associated with the photon and with the gamma factor. Here there's an index alpha. So here the indices have to match up and they're summed over. Okay, so you think of this basic vertex there's a factor i e gamma alpha, and here you have your factor uh, epsilon k prime alpha. So these alpha indices are summed over, and similarly the other vertex uh, for the betas. And remember, of course, the structure here. What's the structure here? I've got a four-dimensional row vector. Here I've got numbers. Here I've got a four-by-four four matrix. The Feynman propagator in momentum for the fermion is another 4x4 four four matrix. The gammas here are also 4x4 four four matrices. And here I have a column vector. So the whole thing, when you multiply it all out, gives you a complex number. <coughs> OK. Um, maybe let me just ask if there are any, at this point, if there are any, if there are any questions. It's our first sort of real Feynman diagram. I mean, it's a process that can occur on its own. Are there any questions about this? Questions about this? So the, the last example, um, if instead of emitting photons, you're, if you're absorbing a photon, you just switch the order of the, the gamma. The yes. Gamma. Yes, that's right. Um, so the last example was. Um, so what, what were we doing? We were looking at, um, yeah, we'll probably get to remitting. You're saying if you're absorbing. Right, if you're absorbing, so for instance, like this here, so there would be a fact. So the thing about the, um, the alphas, um, whether it's initial or final photon, it's still the same factor. So it would, it would have been just the momentum label would be changed. So that would still be there. And, and and with the right index for that vertex. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, we we'll do more. Let's do more examples. More examples. Let's now look at electron-electron um, scattering. So um, we have uh, so we have an electron and electron that scatter off each other. So the Feynman diagram looks like this. So the incoming electrons, momentum P1 and P2. The outgoing electrons, momentum P1 prime, P2 prime. There's an internal photon line with four momentum k, remember four momentum is conserved at each vertex, so I can write it as p2 minus p2 primed. Here I know it doesn't really matter which I can choose the direction of the formula, I can choose the arrow to be this way or that way, it doesn't matter. But if I choose it this way, 
then if you look here, I have um, the four momentum coming into the vertex is P2. The four momentum coming out is P2 prime and K. So K has to equal P2 minus P2 prime. Okay. So think, imagine, think of currents going into, a, you know, wires joining up. The sort of currents in and currents out. Um, it, it's like that. Remember, this is not a space-time diagram. This is an abstract diagram. Called a, technically, it's called a Feynman diagram in momentum space. The only, when I say time goes from left to right, all I mean is, is that this is the initial state and this is the final state. But this is just sim symbolic. It's not, a, it's not a diagram in space-time. So just think of this as a node with momenta, with a flow in or out. And um, there's this conservation of the vertex. So, um, so what do we do? So let's say with this um, vertex, there's a there's a space-time index alpha. Here's a space-time index beta. What is our Feynman amplitude? Notice that the order of fermion factors I underline here for each fermion line. Here we've got two fermion lines to follow. Okay, so now let's be careful. So let me write it all down, and then we'll go through it. So P1 prime, I E gamma alpha, U P1, uh, times, that means P F alpha beta, P2 minus P2 prime, um, uh, time, let me write it like this, times u bar p2 prime i e gamma beta u p2. So what are we doing here? We've got two fermion lines to follow. Okay, so this is just all the examples done so far, there's just been one fermion line. Here there are two. So let's start with the top one. Now what do we do? We read, so we're just looking at this piece here. Okay, this is a, this is a complex number because this is, um, and of course, like an idiot, I've missed off the bar here, that should be u bar. So this is a row vector times a four by four matrix times a column vector. This is by itself a complex number, okay? The Feynman propagator for the photon, there are no matrices involved. These are just numbers. All right, so these are also just numbers. Here again, this piece here, I have a row vector times a 4 by 4 matrix times a column vector. It's again a complex number. So I've got a complex numbers times complex numbers times complex numbers. The whole thing's a complex number. But each of the, this factor corresponds to the top fermion line. So what do I do? I read from right to left. I have an incoming electron. I write down the factor U. Hit a vertex. Factor IE gamma alpha. Final electron. Factor U bar. Okay? This gives me... This is the factor just for this line. Then there is, remember the rule for each internal photon line, there is a factor. This is an internal photon line. So I write down a factor where the argument of the Feynman propagator is the momentum of the internal photon line. Then there is the other fermion line. Again, reading from right to left, I follow the direction of the arrow. I have an in initial electron, factor u, u, u with our momentum p2. Hit the vertex, i.e. gamma beta, final electron factor u bar with the appropriate momentum. Okay, that is the Feynman amplitude for electron-electron scattering. Okay, so so be be clear about the structure of each term. For remember, for each fermion line, reading from right to left, you follow the sequence along the direction of the arrow. Complex number, complex number, complex number, the whole thing is a complex number. And the differential cross-section, we're going to look in the last lecture, we'll look at some examples of differential cross-sections are proportional <coughs> to the modular square <coughs> of this amplitude. 
Um, okay, one other thing. Okay, one other example. All right, so um, before I move on, so is everyone clear on, uh, on this? Enough. Okay, good. All right, now I'm going to look at the example of a positron scattering from a photon. So it's, um, it's Compton scattering but with positrons. So um, it's the same thing but with a slight twist. So we're going to have a positron and a photon scattering. So, the Feynman diagram looks like this. So it's just like what we had for Compton scattering of an electron. We have photon momentum K, incoming momentum P, outgoing momentum P primed, and K primed. Except now, this is a positron, so the arrows on the fermion line go backwards. Um, there is also the internal four momentum is now equal to minus P minus K. And here there's recipe for, there, there's a distinct possibility of confusion. So, why is the momentum flow here? Why is it minus P minus K? So remember, the uh, four momentum is conserved at each vertex. So here, here I have photon four momentum K coming in. Here I have a four momentum Q coming in. What's happening here? Here you have to be here you have to be careful. This is one of these annoying things about this thing with the arrows going backwards. The four momentum of the of the positron coming in is P, but that's this way. In this direction, there is a four momentum P. If I have the arrow pointing the other way. The four momentum along the direction of the arrow is actually minus p. Okay. Now, if this all seems, if I remember, this is in the end, it's just a symbolism. It's just a convenient way of summarizing the rules for the for the, the, this perturbation series. This is what comes out. If you want to summarize this in a series of rules, this is the way it works. That for the positron lines, you have to reverse the direction of the arrow. For the four, the four momentum is conserved at each vertex in this sense. Here I have a four momentum Q coming into the vertex. Here I have a four momentum K coming into the vertex. The four momentum coming out of the vertex is minus P. Okay, because it's plus P coming in. If you reverse the direction of the arrow, it's minus P. So what I would write down is you would say, well, look, let's let's balance the four momentum at this vertex. What's the four momentum coming in? The four momentum coming in is K plus Q. I've got K coming in, I've got Q coming in. The four momentum coming out is minus P. Okay, so if I require that K plus Q is equal to minus P, then I have to have K Sorry, I have to have Q equal to minus P minus K. Okay, so beware that the um, if I, if I have if I have an external electron line. If I have an electron line coming in, and I say I have an electron of four momentum p, well, then you know there is in the direction of the arrow there is a four momentum p. But if I have a positron of four momentum p coming in, then along the direction of the arrow, the 
full momentum is actually minus p. So this is an annoying thing you have to have to keep track of uh, and remember. So let, let's hope, I hope I've explained this clearly. So I've got k coming in, I've got minus p coming out, I've got q coming in. So k plus q has to equal minus p, and so q is minus p minus k. Is, 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 is this clear? Any, any questions about that? Or is that okay? Okay, please, please make sure, because this is something that's easy to slip up on this. So uh, please uh, be careful. All right, so apart from that little oddity, writing down the Feynman amplitude um, is easy. It's, it's, uh, so here we've got Vp, epsilon k alpha, i.e. gamma alpha, uh, I S Feynman, remember the Feynman propagator is evaluated with an argument corresponding to the internal form momentum, which here is minus P minus K, I E gamma beta. And I'm getting a bit squashed, let me write it here. Times I E gamma beta. Epsilon k prime beta v p prime. So um, let me. Um, all right. So following the so writing this down. If we're following the fermion line, we read from right to left. We've got just one fermion line. So we have a final positron. So we write down a factor v for a final positron. We've got a final photon, so there's a factor epsilon. We hit the vertex, factor i.e. gamma beta. We've then got the internal fermion line. We form momentum minus p minus k. So we write the factor i s Feynman minus p minus k. We then hit the vertex, another i.e. gamma alpha. Then we've got the final photon, sorry, we've got the initial photon and the initial positron. And so initial positron have a factor v bar. And again, so note the structure, we've got a row vector, we've got um, three four by four matrices, the gammas, the S Feynman, the gammas, and then we've got the column vector again, and so it's a complex number as it should be. So this is the Feynman amplitude for the Compton scattering of photons on positrons. Um, so please be careful. Think about this um, this business. I have um, you know when you have an external positron line, the actual physical form momentum label is one thing. The form momentum in the direction of the arrow is minus that. This form momentum. Okay, simple enough, but uh, easy to slip up. Okay, so that's done. So we've done blah blah, we've done blah blah, we've done blah blah. So there are two other rules to do. Uh, there are two rules to add. And then we'll and then we'll do a couple of examples and we'll be finished. So let's add the last two final rules. So, uh, let's see, okay, rule number six, so here we've done rule zero, like all rule zero, and then so the book doesn't, the rule puts you rule zero is mentioned in the last rule number seven, but so I write it like this. In the actual book, they've just got rules one to seven, with this sort of mentioned as they go along. But anyway, rule zero. Then rule one, two, three, four, five, we've done. Now rule six. So for each closed fermion loop, right? For each closed fermion loop. Take the trace and multiply by minus one. So we'll look at an example. You see what I mean. So for each closed, 
for each closed fermion loop, you, you take the trace and multiply it by a factor minus one. Then seven, final rule. So for each closed loop, for each closed loop, you will have an arbitrary an arbitrary four momentum Q that is not fixed by four momentum conservation. Um, what you do is you carry out the following integral one over Oops. 1 over 2 pi to the power of 4 times the integral over. So there's a, with a, for each closed loop, there's an arbitrary four momentum that is not fixed by anything, and you have to integrate over that four momentum uh, with a factor 1 over 2 pi to the 4. Okay, let's look at two examples just to illustrate, hang on, what, what, what are these rules about? So, um, let's maybe first look at uh, example of rule number seven. Let us say I'm looking at the following diagram. Um, I'm looking at the following diagram. We have an electron coming in that emits a photon and then reabsorbs the same photon. So I have an electron coming in with momentum P. The final momentum P prime is equal to P. And the emitted photon has four momentum K. And so the internal, the four momentum of the internal fermion line is P minus K. Okay, there is four momentum is conserved at each vertex. So I have P coming in, I have Q coming out, K coming out, so Q is P minus K, and the final momentum is just the same as P. Here I have P minus K coming in, K coming in, so P coming out. Um, but notice here that K is arbitrary. K is not fixed by anything. The electron can emit and reabsorb a photon on any four momentum. This diagram actually diverges, by the way. This diagram diverges, and the way you handle this thing, something I've mentioned briefly, but it's something you'd really do in a more advanced course, is mass renormalization. So the idea is the following, that the that the electron, if it's moving freely, if you've just got an electron moving in space, you have all of these diagrams added up. This is the free Feynman propagator, and then you have these terms that, that are added in. The divergent part of this what happens is that I'm just giving you a very hand-waving um, idea here, is that you, the result is that the effective mass of the electron is renormalized. The divergent part of this gives you a correction to the electron mass, which is actually infinite, but you ignore the fact that it's infinite, and you say that, well, the mass that we see is the original mass plus this correction. So there's a way of absorbing this divergence into the observed mass. Um, but that's something for a more advanced course, but just to warn you, just so you know, this, these diagrams with loops diverge. The reason they diverge, let's just write down the Feynman amplitude. So the Feynman amplitude here is going to be, let's write here, um, I, B, F, alpha, beta of K, U bar P I E gamma alpha I S Feynman P 
minus k um, times i e gamma beta u e. This is what you would write down with the Feynman rules if we ignore this last rule. Just with the rules here, if you're following the fermion line, writing from right to left, I have initial electron of momentum piezo factor u, I get a vertex, factor i e gamma beta, I have an internal fermion line, so I have a factor i s Feynman with argument p minus k, I hit the vertex, factor i e gamma alpha, final electron, factor u bar, and the internal photon line contributes a factor i d Feynman for a Feynman photon propagator, evaluated momentum k. But k here is arbitrary. That's the, fine, that's the Feynman amplitude that you would get from these rules. But now the seventh rule says that for each closed loop, when you have an arbitrary four momentum, you have to integrate over that four momentum. In this case, the four momentum, let me move over a bit. Where's a bit? Oh, okay, D4. And to integrate all of this with respect to D4, integrate over the photon for momentum k and put in a factor 1 over 2 pi to the fourth. And that is the Feynman amplitude. Now you may remember way back when we were looking at the um, expectation, so the, so, so the ground state energy, the energy of the vacuum, we found it diverged because when you integrate over the frequency, there's no upper limit on the integral, you get a divergent result. Something similar happens here if you work out this integral because there's no upper limit on the frequency, this photon can have an un unboundedly large frequency or large, and so this integral actually diverges. And, um, and so as I said, to handle this divergence, you have to extract the infinite part and absorb it into a redefinition of the electron mass. Um, so um, anyway, but as I said, that's something for a more advanced course. But there's, there's rule number seven, in action. Um, let's now look at an example illustration. So this is just the Feynman rule that you would have written down. There's just an extra thing. If, the, if, if there's an internal four momentum that's undetermined, you have to integrate over that four momentum with this factor. Okay. So final example to illustrate rule number six is um, when we have a fermion loop so here we have a photon coming in with four momentum k, which then turns into, using sort of um, heuristic language, it turns into an electron-positron pair, which annihilate again to produce an outgoing photon with four momentum k prime equal to k. Here I have um, two internal fermion lines, one of four momentum p, one of four momentum p plus k. Remember the four momentum flow can serve at each vertex. So here I have k coming in, I have p coming in, so I have p plus k coming out. Here I have p plus k coming in, p coming out, k coming out. Okay, so four momentum is conserved at each vertex. If I was going to write down the Feynman rule, just ignoring 6 and 7, just from, from rules uh, 0 to 5, what I would have written down would be the following. I would have said, well, epsilon k alpha, i e gamma alpha, i s Feynman, e plus k, Epsilon k beta i e gamma beta i s Feynman of p. So what I can do, so here there's a fermion line, it's a closed fermion line. Remember we have to follow the, the order of factors, we have to read from right to left and follow the arrows along the fermion line. 
where do we start on the fermion line? Well, let's just start somewhere. Let's just start here. We're going to start here and say, well, I have an internal fermion line with momentum P. So I write a factor Is final of P. I continue, I hit the vertex. So there's a factor I e gamma beta. I have an external photon line, so we put in a factor of simon. I carry on, I have an internal fermion line with four momentum P plus K. So I now have a factor I S Feynman with four momentum P plus K. I carry on, I hit another vertex, there's I E gamma, and then there's an external photon line, a factor of epsilon. That's what I would have written down with the rules over on the board here. But now, hang on, here I've got a 4x4 four four matrix, 4x4 four four matrix, four. this is a, uh, I've got a product of four 4x4 four four matrices, this is a 4x4 four four matrix. It's supposed to be a complex number. So rule number seven to the rescue, if you calculate the matrix element from first principles, what you find is that the Feynman amplitude looks like this, is that you, you have this thing here that is indeed a 4x4 four four matrix. But now you take the trace of that matrix, so you get a number, and you multiply by minus 1. All right, that's rule number 6. For each closed fermion loop, you take the trace and multiply by minus 1. There's still the fact here that P is arbitrary. For each closed loop, you also get an undetermined internal form momentum. So what do we do? Well, rule number seven tells us that we have to integrate over P with a factor one over two pi to the fourth. And this is the Feynman amplitude for this process. Um, this again diverges. So this, um, so that I should have mentioned that what, I don't, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, that this diagram here where you have an electron emitting and reabsorbing a photon is called the electron self-energy diagram. So because and think of this as representing an electron interacting with itself. It absorbs and re-emits a photon. It's the electron self-energy diagram. It diverges. To handle it, you have to renormalize the mass. This term here is called the photon, the photon self-energy. Self-energy diagram. It again diverges, but the way you handle this is through a charge renormalization, which again is a topic for a more advanced course. Um, what do I think about if I had a, a, a more? Is let's say, well, let's say you have two electrons interacting, okay, by exchanging a photon. Just giving you a rough idea. If I include the electron self-energy term, here at each vertex there's a factor E. At each vertex there's a factor E. What you can do, the divergent part of this diagram, you can reabsorb by defining an effective electron charge, which is E plus delta E, where this thing is formally infinite. The infinite there's an infinite contribution from this term that just renormalizes the charge. So if there is, there is a plus I should mention that this diagram here, it diverges, but there's an infinite part. You can also extract a finite part. So what you get after you, if you redefine the electron charge in this way, there's a remainder term from this diagram that is finite that actually gives you corrections to electron-electron scattering. So what happens here, this is your sort of lowest order electron-electron scattering. If you include this correction, you get an infinite part that renormalizes the electron charge, and then you get a finite part that gives you a small correction to this process. So this is, this is how I want. But as I say, this stuff is for a more advanced course. Now you'll notice here, the, when you have closed loops, 
there is always this arbitrary uh, undetermined form momentum that you have to integrate over, and this is where you get the divergences from. If you don't have closed loops, you normally get any divergences. So um, the kind of processes, if you're just looking at lowest order, you know, I'm interested in electron-electron scattering. What is the dominant term? This is the dominant term. Forget about closed loop. You don't have to worry about renormalization. There are no divergences. Um, so, but in a more advanced course, you learn how to handle these things. Something, someone, if someone's awake, they might ask the question, hang on a second, when you wrote down this, this term here, you started here in the loop, and, you, and so you first wrote down this factor, and you got the order. What if I first started up here? I could have started here, and first written down this factor and then gone around and put, and then written down this factor, I would have got a different order of terms here. Why don't I get something different? The answer is that, well, you may remember that the trace of a product of matrices, the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA. So if I permute the order of terms here, if I put this IS final P over here, actually the value of the trace is the same. So if I so it doesn't actually matter <coughs> where you start. If I start right, I could start at this vertex, I could write down this vertex factor, and then the factor for this internal line, and then the vertex factor, and then the, the trace is the same. Um, and so there we are. So we've done all of the Feynman rules uh, for QED. Um, and um, on Thursday, we're going to look at uh, some examples of cross section. Let's say the cross section for Compton scattering that you obtain from the, the, the mod square of this amplitude. But these are the Feynman rules. So please uh, think through these examples. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please see me, ask for an office hour. Uh, we're at the top of the mountain. Here is, you know, the culmination really of the course. Now you can go out into the world and calculate uh, processes using these rules. Um, we'll look at some examples on Thursday. Um, and, uh, you know, those of you who are interested, you might be thinking, well, where does this trace come from? If you think, where does this trace come from? If you really want to see it, if you go back into the book, and, and you'll find, you know, there's a, there's a term in the S matrix expansion that corresponds to this diagram. If you want to check, work out the matrix element, you'll find that it comes out to be like this, as a, as a trace comes out. Um, but, you know, as I said, in the end, all the results of those calculations can be summarized by these rules. So, uh, so there we are. No questions? All right, there we go. Thank you.